Welcome to Think Catholic, your source for Catholic thought with depth and devotion. I'm Mary, your host for this episode, and joining me on this episode is founder of Think Catholic, Austin Habish, and Dr. Alan Femister. Would you guys like to say hello? Happy to be here. This is hello. Austin. Hello, this is uh, Dr. Femister, <laughs> Alan. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Today, we'd like to discuss the Catholic thought on, is there evidence for the soul? We'd like to talk on three points. What is the soul? What does the soul is the form of the body mean? Is there evidence for it? And why does it matter? So to start us off on this conversation, I'm going to read from a quote from the Council of Vienna, which was an ecumenical council of the Roman Catholic Church from 1311 to 1312. Furthermore, with the approval of the above-mentioned sacred council, we reprove as erroneous and inimical to the Catholic faith every doctrine or position rashly asserting or turning to doubt that the substance of the rational or intellective soul truly and in itself is not a form of the human body, defining so that the truth of sincere faith may be known to all, and the approach to all errors may be cut off, lest they steal in upon us, that whoever shall absolutely presume in turn to assert, define, or hold that the rational or intellective soul is not the form of the human body in itself and essentially must be regarded as a heretic. Deaf words, the anathema sit, (laughs) essentially. Well, I guess not to that degree. No, it's the same same penalty. I see. It's more explicit Mm -hmm. in some sense. (laughs) So clearly, there's some passion about the necessity of believing the soul is the form of the human body. And if you don't believe that, you're a heretic. That so is. let us first start with that first question. What does that mean? What does the soul is the form of the body mean? I'll, I'll go ahead and, and lead us off there. So what do we mean by form? And I, I think the easiest way to explain form is by an example. Uh, we can take one from chemistry, for example. So if you, uh, we can make water... H2O in the lab by combining dihydrogen H2 with oxygen. Now, it's the structure of hydrogen and and oxygen, or it's because of the structure, that each is incredibly flammable. That's why they say you shouldn't smoke next to oxygen if, if you're using it for breathing, and we make fuel cells out of hydrogen. But when we combine them, we get something very different than hydrogen and oxygen. We get something which not only does not burn at all, but also extinguishes those things which do burn. We get water. And therefore, water cannot be merely, and here's the point of contention with the mechanistic philosophy or a contemporary mechanistic philosophy, water cannot be merely the addition or the combination of these flammable elements or else water would also be flammable. Water is obviously not flammable, and this is because when H2 and oxygen come combine to make H2O, the entire inner structure of the thing, including the structure of the hydrogen and oxygen atoms themselves, changes, making the whole thing now non-flammable. And the technical term for that innermost structure of a thing, what gives it its structure, making it both to be and to be in its own particular way, like being flammable or not, is the form, a thing's form. So when hydrogen and oxygen become water, what changes is the form. Water has its own unique form, different from and taking the place of what used to be the forms of hydrogen and oxygen. So if we apply this notion to the dogma, the council is saying that the intellectual soul is what gives both the existence and that inner structure essential qualities of the human body. It is the form of the human body, Doc, if you wanted to add. Yeah, the form is is um, the most immediate answer to what we mean by the word what. The form is what something is. And uh, if you imagine matter which is what makes something this is uh, this uh, water rather than that water or this water rather than that cup um, matter is like a kind of uh, you know cookie dough 
and the form is uh, it's like the shape of the cookie cutter to to use a crude analogy which 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 parcels off one one bit of matter from another bit of matter and um uh, <clears throat> so the so the the what uh, the idea that the soul is the form of the body is 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 most immediately rejecting are the Platonic and the Cartesian, although of course the Cartesian version didn't exist yet in the 14th century uh, when that definition was issued. But anyway, it's rejecting those ideas of what the soul is. So the idea that the soul is a kind of separate entity which makes use of the body as if it was like a remote control car being operated by the soul from somewhere else. or um, <clears throat> so that they, So by being the what of the substance, in this case a human being, the soul and the body are intimately united so that the, the human being is one entity composed of body and soul, what we call the composite. So uh, St. Thomas can say in his commentary on 1 Corinthians rather pithily, he says, anima mea non est ego, I am not my soul. It's easy to remember because mm. um, when you, uh, as most Thomists, in fact, would say that when the soul and the body are separated, the soul is technically not the person. So that Saint Peter, in a certain sense, doesn't currently exist. Saint Peter's soul exists, uh, which allows you to reboot Saint Peter at the end of time when he gets his body back, um, uh, and his consciousness has continuity because his soul still exists. But but in fact, Saint Peter is the composite not St. Peter's soul. So Our Lady still exists, as it were, because she has body and soul, but but um, St. Peter is only the black box flight recorder for St. Peter um, <laughs> that still exists, Doc, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. I think it's so important you mentioned there that some of the pitfalls of erroneous no- notions of the soul, the temptation nowadays is probably more the Cartesian dualistic understanding of the relationship between the soul and the body. So someone thinks that uh, to explain a qualia or qualia, for example, my uh, the sensations, my um, the qualities of the world, so it's color, it's taste, uh, sound and music, they'll say, well, there, there must be something immaterial about me, but it is wholly distinct from the matter, and it runs into the notorious interaction problem. If my body is wholly material and my soul is wholly immaterial, and there's this hard distinction not the one union informed matter, the intimate union is, as you put it, that uh, we that the council is speaking of. Then how do the how do they interact? How is the material then influencing the holy spiritual and the spiritual wholly influencing the material? That hard part notoriously runs into issues with, let's say, the law, the conservation of energy. That energy cannot neither be destroyed or created how then is the the holy material body influencing the soul it would seem like energy is going out of the universe and then it's coming back into it from the soul if you presuppose the mechanistic world view so that intimate union solves a lot of problems before they even begin i, like yeah, this... I think plates oh sorry Mary. i just like i like this notion that we're not exclusively one or the other that were this composite union it still seems pretty abstract to comprehend but go ahead doc what were you going to mention oh well i the plato's conception is is less absurd than descartes just to say in defense of poor old plato i mean he he has this idea that we're sort of uh kind of angels imprisoned in bodies um whereas uh descartes has this idea that mind is non-extended thing and uh thinking non-extended thing so it's like essentially an infinitesimally small marble self-aware marble um uh, whereas the, the body is like a machine essentially extended uh a mach- but it's a machine because he thinks that all matter is is continuous it's all just the same stuff and what makes essentially i mean he probably thinks it's Play-Doh, but uh, a lot of his contemporaries and immediate successors would think of it in terms of Lego bricks. Um, but uh, but anyway, he's um, he he thinks that it's all you're you're essentially this infinitesimally self-aware marble operating a machine. And the problem with that, one of the, the interaction problem that Austin was mentioning, is that is that if you're an infinitesimally small marble 
then essentially how do your little teeny weeny fingers reach the levers to operate the machine they're right. still infinitely <laughs> far from the levers it doesn't help you know right. he thought he thought the soul was this like this teeny weeny marble in the back of your neck in the pituitary gland or whatever um, but it doesn't matter how tiny the control room is for operating the body if you're a mathematical point your fingers are still infinitely far from the levers and there's nothing you can do about it so of course, of course it ends up making as a lot of Descartes philosophy does it ends up making theism and traditional Christian doctrine absurd right. you know one ways one of the ways of winning an argument uh, a dishonest shabby way of winning an argument is the straw man fallacy you create another position which isn't what your opponent is saying but which is silly and easy to refute and then you go ahead and refute that and impress the audience and make them ignore your opponent and Descartes whether intentionally or unintentionally fulfilled that function for western civilization um and on that note from a scripture level from genesis we we see god says that he breathed life into adam and this notion that there's this soul being breathed into the human body will lead us to our, our second point that is there evidence for it it sounds like a nice a nice thought a nice principle um, but what evidence do we have for the for the soul? Uh, I think one of the easy ways to look at this would to use the concept justice as an example, and we can use it in two ways. I'll go through one, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to the doc uh, before moving into the second. But the first is we can understand justice. If we ask what size is justice, what shape is it, what are its dimensions? Because if it's, we would ask that because if it's material, then it must have a particular size, a particular shape, yet justice has neither of those. And this because it is not material, but immaterial, an immaterial concept. And yet a very real one, real enough for us to talk about it, to write books about it, real enough for us to sentence men to death via fair trial because of it. But to know what justice is, it must somehow be in us and not merely in the brain because the brain is material. So this immaterial part of me, which must hold and consider, which can hold and consider this non-material concept, which is justice, is what we mean, mean by the soul or more specifically, the faculty of the soul called the mind. Now it's important to note that the mind obviously uses, works with the brain because we have to wait for the brain's development to have abstract thought, and we see very clearly that damage to the brain clearly impairs a person's ability to reason. But at the same time, the mind is neither housed in nor an act of any particular part of the body, including the brain, or else our knowledge would be limited to only particular things, which would rule out general notions such as justice. And this becomes clear to us if we look to the senses as an example of how being housed in the particular limits the power to the particular. So sight or hearing, they don't grasp color in general or music in general. They grasp particular colors, particular sounds, and because their activity comes from particular organs, the eyes and the ears. But we do know what color is in general music or sound in general, and this is because the mind isn't an act of some particular part of the body. Again, if it were, it would be like sight or hearing, unable to grasp the general and the abstract, such as justice or math or geometry. And I'll also say one more thing. Since this act of the mind is not housed in nor an act of a bodily organ, it can continue even after the body perishes. It has a kind of independence in that way, allowing the soul to endure after the body perishes, making us immortal. What I hear is we have these immaterial ideas like justice, so there must be some part of us that also are, is immaterial to consider. In short, in brief, yeah. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, although I'd say uh, slightly, you said making us immortal, it makes our souls immortal, it doesn't make us immortal for the reason we spoke about the, before. The composite, <clears throat> right, yeah. Yes, um, uh, and it's because in order for a, an individual to perish, what, what, you, what happens when an individual perishes is that you separate 
what it is from what makes it this individual. So you separate the cookie dough from the shape imposed by the cookie cutter. But if in this case, the thing that gives it its, its whatness, its form, is uh, immaterial or has an essentially immaterial part, um, then, dis- then separating those two elements of the composite will not lead to the destruction of the form, only to the destruction of the body. That's why the, the that's why the form endures after the destruction of the composite. But it, it it's not good. I mean, and again, contrary to the Platonic or Aristotelian, sorry, Platonic or Cartesian rather, um, <coughs> conception of these things, <coughs> because although although the intellect appar- operates apart from a material organ, it, it, everything in it comes to it through the body. Right, there is nothing in the intellect which is not first in the senses, as St. Thomas says. So, so you're you're a bit knackered if you're if if they if they destroy your body, if somebody destroys your body or it just falls apart or whatever, then there's nothing going into your intellect anymore. Now, we because our culture is saturated with now completely garbled and misunderstood Christian concepts, we have this idea that, you know, oh, you know, people who believe in the immortality of the soul, they believe in heaven and they think that's really nice and pie in the sky when you die. And that's, but that's not, that's not at all the, the metaphysics of it. And um, without Christian revelation, which by the way, isn't that everybody goes to heaven, rather the reverse. Um, uh, but anyway, um, not that everyone goes uh, without, to hell either. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> but near, nearer to the reverse. Um, uh, the um, uh, um, without uh, Christian revelation, you would conclude, as ancient cultures generally correctly did conclude, that the the life of someone of a soul apart from the body would be utterly miserable. So I think it's in in uh, is it in the Odyssey where, where Odysseus meets Achilles. Uh, who says that he would, and he's greatly honoured in the underworld by others for having been a sort of action hero while he was alive, despite being an insufferable, horrible person. But anyway, um, uh, and he says, but he would prefer to be the lowest slave on earth than a king in Hades, right? Um, and and that's because, in fact, the state of the soul separate from the body. Uh, just considered naturally would be a very miserable reduced state, you know, like, you know, you know, somewhere between being in a coma and a permanent vegetative state. I mean, it would be not good because there's nothing in the intellect, which is not first in the senses. Now, the reason for the rather more uh, exciting in both a negative and a positive way uh, condition of the soul after death in reality, that is that you're either in hell, purgatory or heaven, is because of divine justice um, uh, applying things to those souls. Uh, it's not because of the natural condition of the soul. The natural condition of the soul separate from the body would be miserable and gloomy and um, and very, very, very much reduced. Doc, you're also speaking to here the necessity uh, for us to think the, that we have to turn to the phantasm, that even in, in this life we see the dependence between the mind and the brain in that for me to have thought, I have to conjure up a particular image or a mental sound of a word for me to abstract from that particular, the general notion. So we can see it even in this life that there is this this real necessity for us to be to be composite, that we need that that other uh, the, the body in which we are able to uh, to utilize the faculties. Uh, of of the mind the yes uh, sorry no uh, so augustine uh, go ahead uh, sorry augustine has this i think it's augustine has this rather interesting sort of little mental test which helps to make the point for people which is that he says you know if you think of a uh, square then it's easy to think of and easy to imagine a square if you think of a tetrahedron that's like a pyramid with four sides made of three sided triangles then uh, it's easy to imagine and easy to easy to think of a bit more difficult though than thinking of a square if you think of a dodecahedron that's a 12 sided shape made of pentagons that's a little bit more difficult to imagine but just as easy to think about if you think about a chileagon that's a thousand-sided shape. It's equally easy to uh, think about, but it's 
impossible. Pretty much impossible to imagine. You just <laughs> right. you just imagine the shape. You know, gobstoppers when you like suck them for a little bit and they become slightly grainy on the external surface. That's more or less what you imagine <laughs> when you think of a chilegon, but it's not really very accurate depiction of a chilegon. So, um, so essentially, what's the reason for this difference is because uh, it's your brain which is doing the work of imagining right. these shapes, whereas it's your intellect which is doing the work of conceiving of them. So, so long as the essential notion is 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 the same, it's as easy to think of the idea of a chalagon as a dodecahedron and a tetragon and a and a square, but or a cube. Um, but uh, but but the imagination strains more and more until it just sort of gives up uh, when you get to the chalagon. Fantastic. And that's because yeah. it's your brain doing the phantasm, which is the imagination, but it's your intellect doing the concept. Uh, and so it doesn't have to pump and wheeze yeah. uh, using the body <laughs> in order to. But, but if, if it couldn't imagine anything, then you wouldn't even, we wouldn't be having this conversation and the ideas of a chilegon and a square and a, and a tetrahedron wouldn't have got into your intellect in the first place. And so you wouldn't have even been able to have the idea, which is why if you bang someone on the head hard enough, they will uh, find it difficult to have thoughts, not because you destroyed their concepts, but because you destroyed their images in their brains. Fantastic example, Doc. The... The second component, or the second example, using justice as evidence for the soul, would be that justice presupposes free choice, which presupposes the immaterial mind. So if we're just the brain, and the brain is just atoms, since atoms don't choose, then we are wholly determined by the laws of physics, and we wouldn't have free choice. But justice, just here temporally, presupposes choice, as well as common sense does and law alike, they assume that we could have done otherwise. In other words, that we choose freely. And without free choice, in the words of Aquinas, quote, counsels, exhortations, commands, prohibitions, rewards, and punishments would be in vain, end quote. So the point he's making is that society at large witnesses to free choice. And I think besides that evidence, that which comes from society in general, a moment's self-reflection will show that we do make genuine choices. We clearly experience ourselves choosing between hitting the snooze for 10 minutes or getting out of bed or having a second coffee or just one. And the only way we can have free choice is if there's more to us than atoms or even instinct because instinct isn't free choice either. We see very clearly that atom or animals, definitely they make judgments, but their judgments are wholly determined by their surroundings through instinct. So when the zebra sees a lion, it runs from it. It doesn't stop to befriend it or to converse with it. But we do those things. As we see, for example, in the many times that bears have killed their trainers or other people who thought that the bear was a friend to them. And the reason that we don't run, contrary to the zebra, from a bear when we see it is not because it's not dangerous to us but because we're not wholly determined by our surroundings or by our instincts. And this is possible because of our ability to grasp the abstract, because of the immateriality of the mind, which allows us, within the same one scenario, to draw out any number of different meanings or notions from it, and therefore act differently within it. So that the one man looking at a bear or a lion draws out the notion of dangerous animal and runs away, and another draws out the notion of friend or fellow creature and doesn't, made possible by the immateriality within us. So, more or less, it gets you killed, the intellect. It does. (laughs) Um, We're not as smart in some regards as the instincts (laughs) of non-rational animals. But in regard to free choice, I mean, the the, the key thing is, is, is the notion of the good so we have this 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 transcendental notion of the good um, as distinct from being, you know, the perfection or fullness of being, which in our case involves happiness, as we talked about last time. Mm-hmm. And and we can see that nothing concrete and finite uh, is infinite good, uh, because we have a concept of the notion of the good, and as a result, we it, we see it as not desirable under some aspect or other. Uh, whatever it happens to be, you know, I love tuna fish sandwiches, but I just happen to want a beef sandwich today. So, um, understandable. And, um, 
Yes, and uh, so I um, so that means that we're always able to make a determination as to whether or not this particular concrete thing will bring me happiness in these circumstances, which is what gives us the power of choice. Which is why, if we came across the infinite good immediately, I God, uh, our wills would adhere to Him infinitely and perfectly. It wouldn't impede our freedom because it would be the absolute infinite realization of our will, but it would prevent us from ever sinning. Because, because we would just encounter the infinite good. But as long as we're in encountering finite goods, we can always choose between them. And so the next question is, why does it matter? If we are just, if we are more than just bodies, um, what, what, does, what, what ramifications does that have? We live in a generation of YOLO, you only live once, which has this connotation that just live, live life to the fullest. Um, your body is all that matters and just maximize that pathway. Uh, so what I'm hearing you say is having a soul um, as the innermost form- structure of the human body seems to have some strong ramifications. The story that always comes to mind when I think of this question is when I was a seminarian, I remember going with another seminary to Dave and Buster's. I'd never been to Dave and Buster's for, uh, before. They call it uh, an adult uh, arcade. And uh, the seminary I was with, he'd received these gift cards to go there. And we didn't know how much money was on them. And we really just had one goal. We're going to go here. We're going to spend up however much money are on these cards. And we're going to play whatever games are there. And that's what we did. For about the first 40 minutes, we would just go from game to game, waiting for these cards to run out. And then we had a realization that changed everything. And that was, we discovered in the side of the arcade a small prize shop that you could take the tickets that you had received from the games and you could go to that prize shop and you could purchase something, something that you could take with you that would endure past the arcade. And then all of a sudden, we couldn't just play any game. We could only play the one game which gave us the most tickets. So our our conduct within the arcade became much more serious and meticulous. <laughs> and we were keeping track of you know, every single, I don't know uh, what they would call it in the card, but every credit we had was accounted for. And so I think there's an analogy here with the soul. If there is no soul, then as it says in First Corinthians, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Let's just have a good time spend it up, it's not going to last anyways. But if there is something that endures, I think it adds a kind of gravity to our lives. It gives a kind of maturity in our decisions and then a meaningfulness in our life so that every second counts and everything that we do matters because it will have eternal consequences. So I would say the gravity and maturity and the meaning that comes with the very strong evidence of the soul. Yeah, I, I, um, it's, it's, it's very subtle the, the effect that this has. I mean, it, it goes back a bit to my remark before about Descartes being the straw man, which allows Western civilization to reject Christianity, which is in fact uh, a bizarre caricature of Christianity or, or weird caricature of a reduced garbled version of the naturally knowable bits of Christianity, um, which is what Cartesianism ends up being. Um, Because, I mean, as I said, in the ancient world, people had a conception that something of you survived death, but it was a pretty miserable, reduced something of you that survived death. And so they were very keen on this life, um, but they weren't. um, And they did even have a sense that if you were incredibly impressive, there might be some kind of post-mortem you know, reward of being made a god or something. And if you were really terrible, you might be sent to Tartarus. But in general, they thought that you were going to be just, you know, really bored and miserable forever after you died. Um, and so that did affect ancient culture and the way they saw things. Um, whereas modern culture, we've we've got this stupid idea of kind of universalist, dumbed-down Christianity, where everybody goes to heaven and that's what Christianity is about. And then they convince themselves that that's a stupid fairy tale. And so they adopt, in contrast to that, imagining that somehow th- th- this is what Christianity teaches and this is what the immortality of the soul implies, which it isn't. Um, they, they imagine instead of that total mental extinction, they think is, is what is the alternative. So they... they they, they go to an extreme 
far beyond and divergent from natural reason, which was more or less a common sense natural reason position was what the ancient pagans held about the nature of life after death. Um, instead, moderns have this idea of total mental extinction. So they think, you know, well, you know, I'm going to die anyway. I don't want to spend ages sitting on the toilet and, and, <laughs> and, and not being able to run very fast and coughing a lot. So I think I'll just do myself in in a clinic in Oregon or Switzerland or whatever. Um, and, um, but of course, that's crazy. I mean, they don't, they've, they've no idea what happens after you die. And if they were actually following natural reason, they would, they would realize that something of you survives, but it's probably not as good as now. And you don't really know what, what may or may not be done to that residuum of you after death. So it'd be completely crazy to throw yourself into that situation. It would be equivalent of of you know somebody's rummaging around in a cupboard in a house they they don't know and they're like oh look here are some little kind of blue kind of spherical things they might be dishwasher tablets or drain cleaner or they might be confectionery items would you like one i mean i mean why why would you hurl yourself into the unknown into peril um with a yeah with a good chance that, that it's not going to be very pleasant either way um uh just yeah it's 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 crazy we've we've talked ourselves as a society into this absurd position which doesn't correspond to natural reason or divine revelation um and is yeah it's is 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 uh is just i mean the the euthanasia of the individual so-called is um is really a kind of metaphor or a sacrament for what we're doing to ourselves as a culture mm. i think also just the notion of justice that we do in our society in our personal life via conscience we know there is such a thing and and if it is true that good deeds go need to be rewarded and evil deeds need to be punished then it, it ought to concern us as to what justice would look like us on the other side i remember knocking doors in the neighborhood and a woman came outside and she said well it's one of two things either i'll just go back to dust or i'll spend eternity in bliss and i remember thinking to myself well there is a third option that is really worth uh, considering lord save us from it austin give us a summary closure of the evidence for the soul from this episode land the plane so the soul is the form of the body it has an intimate union we are a composite that's how they're related to one another it escapes the idealism of plato the cartesian dualism it strikes natural reason we have evidence for it via justice and in two ways so the notion of justice that we can even know it and that justice presupposes free will which presupposes the immaterial immateriality of the mind and the ramifications well it makes a world of difference whether we're going to go on forever or not as pascal said it's certain that the mortality or immortality of the soul must make an entire difference to morality so it it makes all the difference in the world and in the world to come thanks for joining us on this episode of think catholic do you have any questions or comments we'd love to hear them Uh, We hope you will join us again in our next, next discussion. 